Today we will learn and reflect on selected actions in the Peloponnesian War that Thucydides uses as moral lessons on the dangers of hubris in war. These actions happen after the death of Pericles, but before Athens is defeated in the disastrous Sicilian expedition. These actions include the events and speeches of the revolt of Mytilene, the revolution of civil war on Corsaira, and the Melian Dialogue where Athens shows how barbaric men can be in wartime. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in our PowerPoint scripts posted as slides here. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. This video is part of a series of videos on the Peloponnesian Wars. Sparta and her allies became concerned and suspicious as the Athenian Empire grew in power and influence. Conflicts between Athens and the Spartan allies led to the start of the Peloponnesian Wars under the Athenian general and statesman Pericles, who also helped found the radical democracy of Athens. These wars had a brief interlude with the Peace of Nicias, which was not that peaceful, but nevertheless held for six years. And the peace was broken when Athens attacked Syracuse in Sicily and suffered a disastrous defeat in the destruction of a large portion of her fleet and the annihilation of many Athenian rowers and hoplites and generals. All the ancient historians we've studied so far, Herodotus, Thucydides, and Plutarch, all seek out the moral lessons of history so we can apply these lessons to our current day. And we've selected three famous conflicts that Thucydides reflects on more for the moral lessons than they teach us for their effect on the war. First, we'll reflect on the revolt of the Athenian ally, Mytilene of Lesbos, in the account of the revolt of Mytilene, and in the memorable speeches in the Athenian assembly, Thucydides ponders the nature of the Athenian empire and the attitudes of ordinary Athenians towards their empire. Many of the city-states in the Delian League wondered, why do we need to continue to pay tribute to Athens now that the threat from Persia has been removed? Did we trade one tyrant state for another? But a quick look at the map reveals that Mytilene is on the island of Lesbos, which is very close to the Straits of the Dardanelles, guarding access to the colonies in the Black Sea, which provide the grain that Athens depends on to feed its populace. The city-state of Mytilene plotted to rebel against Athens, but the Athenians were informed by the smaller city-states on the island of Lesbos, who feared that Mytilene would seek to dominate the whole island. The Athenians had blockaded Mytilene, while the Spartans sent a commander, Seleithus, to direct them in battle, and sent a fleet of 40 ships, which tarried in their long voyage around the Peloponnese. But the people from Mytilene were anxious, their food was running out, and the Spartan ships were nowhere to be seen, and the people balked at facing the Athenian hoplites in battle. The people demanded that the food stores be shared among all. They suspected the aristocrats were hoarding the food, which was likely true. Fearing insurrection, the aristocrats surrendered their city under these terms to the Athenians. The Athenian army could enter the city. The Mytileneans could send ambassadors to Athens to plead their case. And in the interim, the Athenian commander Pacheus would not harm in prison or enslave the population. And the only paintings we could find in Mytilene was those featuring the poet Sappho, who lived in the island of Lesbos many centuries before. Thucydides tells us Cleon was responsible for passing the original motion to put to death the rebels and the entire male population of Mytilene, and also to enslave their women and children. The Athenian assembly was outraged because Mytilene was an allied rather than a subject state who had appealed for assistance to Sparta and the Spartans had actually sent their fleet to assist them, so the assembly voted to approve the suggestion of Cleon, sending a trireme to Mytilene to instruct Pacheus to put the Mytileneans to death immediately. Now Thucydides then tells us that the next day there was a sudden change of feeling, and people began to think how cruel and unprecedented such a decision was, to destroy not only the guilty, but the entire population of a state. And Thucydides has long speeches, and we're all going to listen to excerpts, where we learn how the Athenians justified their empire to themselves. He has Cleon addressing the assembly. Personally, I have had occasion enough already to observe that a democracy is incapable of governing others. And I am all the more convinced of this when I see how you are now changing your minds about the Middle Aeneans. 
I urge you not to be traitors to your own selves. Now it's really rich that Cleon is trying to behave like Pericles, admonishing the assembly, but they don't always have the same degree of confidence in his words as they did Pericles. And Cleon continues with a thought that Thucydides no doubt agrees with. What you do not realize is that your empire is a tyranny exercised over subjects who do not like it, and who are always plotting against you. You will not make them obey you by injuring your own interests in order to do them a favor. Your leadership depends on superior strength and not on any goodwill of theirs. And Cleon is truly Machiavellian. He later concludes, If they were justified in revolting, then you must be wrong in holding power. If, however, whatever the rights and wrongs it may be, if you propose to hold power all the same, then your interest demands that these two, rightly or wrongly, must be punished. The only other alternative is to surrender your empire so that you can afford to go in for philanthropy. And Cleon adds, punish them as they deserve and make an example of them to your other allies, plainly showing that revolt will be punished by death. Now Thucydides says Diodotus counter the arguments of Cleon, and this is the only mention of Diodotus in the account of Thucydides, and his existence is otherwise forgotten in the sands of history. It is significant that Cleon loses this argument to someone so obscure. So what are the moral lessons that Diodotus teaches us? Diodotus opens his speech, I do not share the view that it is a bad thing to have frequent discussions on matter of importance. Haste and anger are the two greatest obstacles to wise counsel. Haste is paired with folly, and anger is the mark of primitive and narrow minds. Then Diodotus takes aims of the motives of Cleon. Anyone who maintains that words cannot be a guide or action must either be a fool or have a personal interest at stake. He is a fool if he imagines that it is possible to deal with uncertainties any other way. And Cleon is personally interested if his aim is to persuade you into some disgraceful action, and knowing that he cannot make a good speech in a bad cause, he tries to frighten his opponents and his hearers by some good-sounding misrepresentations. Then he turns the arguments of Cleon on its head, that whether the Mytilenaeans are guilty and innocent, whether they should be harshly punished or not, is not nearly as important as the morally ambivalent question of what course of action is in the best interests of Athens. Diodotus asks the assembly, consider this now. If a city has revolted and then realizes that the revolt cannot succeed, it will come to terms while it is still capable of paying an indemnity and continuing to pay tribute afterwards. But if Cleon's method is adopted, can you not see that every city will not only make much more careful preparations for revolt, but will also hold out against siege to the very end, since to surrender early or late brings on this very same punishment. And this is unquestionably against our best interest to spend money on a siege because of the impossibility of coming to terms. And if we capture the place to take over a city that is in ruins so that we lose the future revenue from it. And it is on this revenue that our strength in war depends. Now the right way to deal with a free people is this not to inflict tremendous punishments on them after they have revolted, but to take tremendous care of them before this point is reached, to prevent them even contemplating the thought of revolt, and if we do have to use force with them, to hold as few of them as possible responsible for the revolt. Now the assembly voted to reverse their decision of the prior day, and we will lose the drama unless we let Thucydides tell the tale. Immediately another trireme was sent out in haste, as the first trireme had a day's head start. The ambassadors from Mytilene provided wine and barley for the crew and promised great rewards if they arrived in time. So the rowers ate while they rowed continually, napping in shifts, not eating their meals on the beaches as was usually done. Luckily, they had no wind against them. The first ship was not hurrying on its distasteful mission, while the second trireme was pressing on with great speed. Soon after the first ship arrived, with Pakes reading the decree, preparing to enforce it, the second ship put into harbor and prevented the massacre. So narrow had been the escape of Mytilene. About a thousand Mytileneans involved in the revolt were executed, and the fortifications were destroyed. The navy was seized. Athenian shareholders were installed on seized land, and the entire island of Lesbos became subjects of Athens. These punishments were harsh, but the people of Mytilene were spared. They were neither executed nor enslaved they could continue to live and prosper as free men. Thucydides also tells us about the revolution sparked at Corsaira. Thucydides reports that the revolution at Corsaira was put into motion with prisoners of war released by the Corinthians, 
and these returning Corsairan soldiers sought to overthrow the radical democracy instituted by Athens. They first brought litigation against Pythias, leader of the radical democrats, and after that suit was dismissed, they broke into a meeting of the council and stabbed to death Pythias and 60 other officials and bystanders. Of course, the delegation informed the Athenian assembly of these unfortunate events. The radical democrats who sided with Athens seized the central district of the city, while the aristocrats who sided with Sparta seized the Acropolis. Both sides offered slaves their freedom for enlisting, but most slaves sided with the democrats. Thucydides said that even the women joined in the fighting with a great daring, hurling down tiles from the rooftops and standing up to the din of battle with a courage beyond their sex. By sunset, the aristocrats were in full retreat, and they set fire to the houses and apartments around the town square, sparing neither their own property nor that of others. And if a wind had arisen and fanned the flames, the whole city might well have been destroyed. Athenian triremes arrived to assist the Corsairan triremes. Spartan triremes arrived also, and all three engaged in naval battle, but the Spartans eventually retreated. Likely hundreds of members of the rebellion were slain by the Democrats, adding to the mayhem. As Thucydides puts it, the victims were accused of conspiring to overthrow the government, but in fact men were often killed on grounds of personal hatred or else by debtors because of the money they owed. And Thucydides states the war led to revolutions and civil wars in many city-states, just as in our world wars led to revolution, overthrow of monarchies, and decolonization. Thucydides states, Practically the whole of the Hellenic world was convulsed, with rival parties in every state. Democratic leaders tried to bring in the Athenians, and oligarchs tried to bring in the Spartans. In peacetime this would not have happened. But in time of war, when each party could always count upon an alliance which could do harm to its opponents, and at the same time strengthen its position, it became natural for anyone who wanted a change of government to call in help from the outside. And Thucydides offers a warning for us today on the dangers of civil strife. Fanatical enthusiasm was the mark of a real man, and to plot against an enemy behind his back was perfectly legitimate self-defense. Anyone who held violent opinions could always be trusted, and anyone who objected to them became a suspect. Family relations were a weaker tie than party membership, since party members were more ready to go to any extreme for any reason whatsoever. And as a result of these revolutions, there was a general deterioration of character throughout the Greek world. And again, we saw many examples of this in both the histories of World War I and World War II. And now we'll discuss the events behind the Melian Dialogue. Thucydides here tells us about a minor military engagement that illustrates how the Athenians were guilty of the primary fault in a warrior culture, the fault of hubris, the overweening arrogance that leads to bad fortune that snatches defeat from the jaws of victory. Now, Milos was a Spartan island colony in the southern Aegean Sea, roughly equidistant between Attica and the Peloponnese. The Athenians sent representatives to demand the surrender of the Melians, the Melians refused to allow them to address the assembly, but rather bade them address the leadership. The Athenians mince no words, make no moral justifications, but rather say that in war, might makes right. And these are excerpts from their long speech in Thucydides. The Athenians say this, We will use no fine phrases saying that we have a right to our empire because we defeated the Persians, or that we have come against you because what you have done to us a great mass of words that nobody would believe. Neither would a protest that you have not aided Sparta in this war do you any good. When matters are discussed by practical people, the standard of justice depends on the equality of power to compel, and that in fact the strong do what they have the power to do, and the weak accept what they have to accept. The Melians ask this, how could it be just as good for us to be your slaves as for you to be our masters? The Athenians answer. You, by giving in, would save yourself from disaster. We, by not destroying you, would be able to profit from you. The Melians, though so far outnumbered that they cannot seek chaos or glory in combat, nevertheless seek to avoid shame. We, who are still free, would show ourselves to be great cowards and weaklings if we fail to face everything that comes rather than to submit to slavery. The Athenians respond, This is no fair fight, with honor on one side and shame on the other. It is rather a question of saving your lives and not resisting those who are far too strong for you. 
The Athenians do not feel bound by a greater good, nor do they fear the judgment of the gods. Our opinion of the gods and our knowledge of men lead us to conclude that it is a general and necessary law of nature to rule whenever one can. Thucydides dryly notes their bitter end. Siege operations were carried out vigorously, with some treachery, and the Melians surrendered unconditionally to the Athenians, who put to death all the men of military age and sold the women and children as slaves. Now, the revolt of Mytilene occurred early in the war in 428 BC when the Athenians were more lenient. As the war became more bitter, both sides committed atrocities. The Melian debate and siege occurred in 416 BC, over a decade later, a few years before the Athenian defeat in Sicily. Even so, the brutality of the Melian massacre was shocking for many Greeks, including many Athenians. In his History of the War, Xenophon mentions Milos when he tells the terror the Athenians felt at the end of the war, when news first came that their fleet had been destroyed, and that Athens was now defenseless from the fleet commanded by the Spartan general Lysander. Xenophon tells us the worries of the Athenians. As news of the disaster was told, one man passed it on to another, and a sound of wailing arose first from the Piraeus, the port of Athens, then all along the long walls till it reached the city. That night no one slept in Athens. They mourned for the loss, but more so for their own fate. They thought that they themselves would now be dealt with as they had dealt with others, with the Melians, colonists of Sparta, after they had besieged and conquered Melos. And then he lists several other atrocities the Athenians regretted committing. And we will have videos on Alcibiades and how Athens eventually lost the Peloponnesian Wars, although the Spartan leader Lysander chose not to execute the military aged men and enslave the women and children of Athens, in gratitude for the part Athens played in defeating the Persians in the Greco-Persian Wars. Now we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Since all of our videos on the Peloponnesian War access many of the same multiple sources, we cut another video reviewing these sources. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.